Morning. Morning. Um, um, I asked the organizer, okay, how many people can I expect? 30. They said, it can be up to 90. I said, oh my God. Uh, but we set a cap to 50. I think it will work. Um, we have to be a bit creative, maybe a bit patient now and then, but it will work. Um, so, let's start. Um, let's first introduce myself. That will be polite. This is me. Ralph. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm 44 years old. And I got some women in my life that were important to me. I got two daughters. Anna, she's 16 and a half. Teenager, real teenager. And I got Zoe. She's 14. She's still kind to me, but will change in a few years. I got a girlfriend, Raluca. She's from Romania. And she lives in the Netherlands with me nowadays. <coughs> this is called the personal map. Because often when I ask people to introduce themselves, they start talking about, okay, I'm a software developer, I'm a manager, I'm something business-wise, doing this for many, many years, successful. And I don't care that much about it, to be honest. I really care about who you are. Because I believe that in the end, successful projects are done with people, by people. And the better that we know each other, the more successful we will be. When I made this personal map, one, two years ago, I realized I made two differences. I made something with work, money. That was when I was employed, working for a company. And something with passion. I always worked with tech companies, software companies. Uh, always product development companies. Uh, did Scrum in 2004 at on Set up a team in Hyderabad. Uh, with RES, we went to Romania. That's where I met my girlfriend. And then in 2015, I started my own company. And that's for me the really the passion. Um, doing Agile, helping companies to do Agile changes, Agile implementations, Scrum, whatever it needs to make them successful, Lean Change Management, and Management 3.0. I've been a manager at those companies, and I really believe that we need a different style of management. Um, also work with disability teams, and also involved in Happy Melee One, the company behind Management 3.0. Um, my values, the things that I really care about, the things that I really, as I said, care about, passionate about, is fun. Things should be fun. I want to have fun. Um, things should be fair. And the older I get, the more I realize fairness is very important for me. If things are not fair, I can be really upset. Really upset. Uh, transparency. I really believe in transparency. Be open, be transparent about the things you care, the things you do in a company, but also as a person. And professional. If you can't do it, then please don't do it. I mean, I really value professional and I really like to work with professional people. So that are my values. <clears throat> if I got some time left, I love to watch Netflix, science fiction series, love them. I read fiction, non-fiction. Uh, I go to the fitness workout, love to do it. And I love to hike in Romania, Scotland. I really love to hike, be out there in the nature, enjoy nature, be alone. I really love it. This is called the personal map. In a normal workshop, I always ask people to make their own personal map and then discuss them, exchange the personal maps and learn from each other. And ask questions about the things that make you wonder. I mean, what do you mean with that mountain, Ralph? Do you only like to walk in mountains? Yeah, because I'm from the Netherlands, pretty flat country, so I really like mountains. Um, and that's how you get to know each other. You can use this with new teams, but also with existing teams. Ask your team members to make a personal map Discuss it once every month in another personal map and let, learn to know each other. Often when I do this and I ask team members afterwards, okay, did you learn something new? Often the answer is yes. I didn't know that he liked dancing. I didn't know that he was into Star Wars, that he had family in Rus Russia, Russland. <coughs> um, and another tip you also can do with this, take a brown paper, put it on the wall. Not this wall, because nothing sticks on this wall. But put it on the wall. And make your personal map on that brown paper with the whole team. And then already start connecting the dots and the different mind maps, personal maps to each other. That during the creation, you already learn from your team members who they are. Personal maps. As I said, because of time constraints, we can't do this individually, but I did want to share this with you and also to introduce myself.
So, Management 3.0, Agile Management, Modern Management. What is it about? Why 3.0? 1.0, let's start with that. In the, always have to think about, in the 19th century, uh, Frederick Taylor in the US uh, looked at machines at factories. And he came up with plans to optimize factories. And he was very successful in that. He really did a great job. Because he realized, if I exactly prescribe what people have to do in a factory with the assembly line, the factory will be more efficient. It will make more money. It worked. It worked that well that a lot of universities did research. He wrote books. Other people wrote books based on his research. And there we had a management approach. And that management approach is still used in many companies. And sometimes it works. I wrote down doing it wrong, but I will get to that later. <coughs> But in the 20th century, and definitely in this century, we realize things are different. A lot of you are working with software, uh, creative work, and it's hard to tell people what to do. I mean, we talked yesterday about telocracy. Uh, the previous session was about it. A lot of things we know, hey, we have to do things differently. So we realize people are the most important asset of our organization. Cool. But still, a lot of organizations have hierarchy. Command and control. The manager sitting in the office, telling the employees exactly what to do and even sometimes how to do it. But that's 2.0, doing the right thing wrong. Example, a manager called me in the Netherlands two years ago. He said, well, I got a great idea. I said, okay, bring it on. He said, I want to have my people, my development team, 30 people, have reviewed them themselves. I don't want to do it anymore because I think they can do it better. I said, Hans, that's a great idea. I mean, I love it. I want to help you. But he said, I'm looking for an approach, a framework in Excel that I can check their grades that they give to each other to make sure that they do it correctly. I said, that's too bad, Hans. That's 2.0. I mean, giving people freedom, but in the end still checking on them. It's the same when you have an innovation market in your company and you ask people to come up with ideas and then the management team decides because they are, they know everything, they are whatever. That's 2.0. So what is 3.0? <coughs> Me? 3.0 is doing it right in the right context. 3.0 is thinking about management as organizations, as communities. We are all responsible. Everybody's responsible. I mean, this morning in the keynote, exactly the same message. Everybody's responsible to make it a great place. In the Netherlands, when it snows, less nowadays, but when it snows, the city, Paul, takes care of the roads, they clean the roads. But every citizen is expected to clean his own pavement, pedestrian area in front of his house. And we all do this, we can walk safely, even when it snows. The city hall takes care of the sewer system, infrastructure, public transport. But everybody living in the city has to make it a great place. We all have to contribute to it. It's exactly how it is also with organizations. Everybody. As I said, doing it right. Based on context. My daughter, 16 years old, she can fry an egg and make a salad. And she can work in a restaurant, in the kitchen, at McDonald's, Burger King, whatever. And that's a restaurant. You can discuss the quality of food, but it's officially a restaurant. And the reason she can work in that restaurant, because everything is prescribed. You flip the burgers after 30 seconds. You put this salad on it, that sauce, etc. Everything is prescribed. So she can work in that environment. A Michelin star restaurant, she's probably not even allowed to do the dishes over there. In that kitchen, it's all about anticipating. What kind of menu do we have? What kind of ingredients do we have? What is the season? What do the customers expect today? That's a totally different environment. That's where 3.0 fits in. And McDonald's, 1.0 fits in perfectly. And 1.0 environments, they are automated nowadays. Remember I talked about factories, assembly lines? More and more is automated. Often people give us an example, call centers. Call centers are automated more and more. Last year at Google I.O., you had that call between the Google AI and a an shop. Yeah, and it was done automatically by a machine, by a computer. So 3.0, <coughs> management. Management is a verb. Management is an activity. And I hear many people say always, we don't need managers, screw management. Let's make it a bit more precise. Yes, we need management. Who of you worked in startup? Okay. Did you have goal setting? Yes. Did you have salaries? I assume yes. 
all those kind of things were there. Did you have managers? Probably, maybe one, maybe even not. Everybody took care of it. Remember the city. When you work in, fact in an organization of 10,000 people, yes, it could be convenient to hire people who focus on management. And some organizations we call them managers. Spotify, we call them, they call them tribe leads, chapter leads, squad leads, whatever. But also they have management. There is no organization without management. I don't believe in it. So management is an activity. And management is responsibility of everybody. Not just the managers, not just the tribe leads, the CEO or whatever. Everybody. And it's the same with software, quality. I don't believe that the software tester is responsible for the quality. I think the whole team is responsible for the quality. The product owner, everybody, not just the tester. The same with management. So management, it's too important only to leave up to managers. We all can take our part in it. <coughs> so, the garden. So what is your role as a manager in an organization? And I shared a blog post, or I'm going to share it in a few days, uh, about an article that somebody says is about gardener. And it's exactly like that. As a manager, you are the gardener of your organization. That garden will grow. Whatever will happen, it will grow. If you want to make it a great garden that you really like, you have to manage it. You have to water it. Just in India, with this kind of weather. You have to give it uh, fertilizer. You have to cut some branches now and then, because you don't like all plants, and some plants get too big. So you need to cut the branches. You need to take out the weeds. But you have to manage the garden. And one thing that you can't do is pull plants out of the ground. It doesn't work like that. You have to be patient. You can plant seeds and you just have to be lucky. And sometimes they don't grow. And sometimes they will grow like very fast and you need to cut them back. That's your role as a manager. The role of management. The last one, this equation. Um, behavior. And it's not correct, I need to adapt it. Behavior is the function of the environment and the people. If you work in an organization, I Let's speak for myself. I can't change people. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. I cannot change them. But what I can do, I can change the environment. And often when I change the environment, I will change the behavior because people need to adapt. Because if you don't adapt, you cannot fit into that organization, into that environment. So your role as manager is also to change the environment. <coughs> So we got four, yeah, five principles in Manage 3.0. Um, the first one is about engaging people and interactions. So all the things that we do in Manage 3.0 is about engaging people and their interactions. Make it great, increase it, make it possible. Believe in the people and make sure that they can communicate. The second principle is improve the system. And we believe that an organization is a complex system. If you know Canafin, that kind of things. An organization is a complex system. It's constantly adapting to its environment every moment of the day. And you need to improve the system, the whole system. Not just the team, but you look at the whole system. The third one is how to delight all customers. And you could have written down stakeholders, internal stakeholders, uh, clients, but you need to delight everybody. And yes, I'm aware that you cannot delight everybody, but at least give it a try. Make everybody happy. And if you only focus on output, and don't take in consideration the happiness of a team, you will have a problem probably. Because the team, yes, they will produce output, but they're totally unhappy. They're also a client, a customer of management. The fourth one, <coughs> already talked about it. Manage the system, not the people. Create the environment. Don't tell people what to do. And the last one is about co-create work. We're doing things together. Everybody. And we're all equal. I mean, it has to be maybe to do with fairness, maybe because I'm from the Dutch, from the Netherlands, but I believe in fairness. And a manager is not much better than me. So we do things together, we co-create work. And all the things in Manage 3.0, all the practices, all the tools, all the games, ideas, are in line with these principles. So what is Manage 3.0? It's not a framework. So it's not like Scrum, okay, we're doing this and that and that meeting, so we are implemented Manage 3.0. Sorry, no. Management 3.0 is a way of looking at the system. It's a way how to deal with an organization. 
it's a set of games. Simulations, if games is to play for, for your CEO. Call it simulations. A set of tools. Constantly changing. Um, but they always stick to those principles. <coughs> and we have over here, I'm aware maybe it's difficult to see for those people, but I will share the pictures afterwards via slide deck. We have Marty. And Marty is a managed 3.0 monster. He represents the six views of management that we think management should take care of. And again, management is everybody. And the first one is about energizing people. Make sure your people are happy, that they're motivated, that they're engaged, that they care about the things that they do. That's your role as management. We're going to do an exercise with that one. The second one is about empowering teams. How do your, te how do your teams know what they are allowed to do? I don't believe that your organization is a playground. I believe that sometimes setting constraints is a good thing. And that's okay. We're going to talk about that also today. The third view is about align constraints. It's okay to have some constraints. It's okay to have metrics. Uh, we talked this morning about bonuses. It could be okay to have bonuses if there are some constraints with them, some guidelines. Align constraints is also about values. What do you care about as a company? The fourth one, develop competence. I mean, you constantly need to increase your knowledge. You need to create an environment where people want to learn, can learn, are able to learn. Grow structure. You don't design a company. You grow a company. If you have 50 teams working on, that's okay, make 15 teams working on a product, you could implement SAFE blindly from the book. Or you could look at it, be inspired, and use the things you need. That is growing. And the last one is improve everything. Keep improving. Create the environment where people can improve, where people can experiment, where they can fail, where they can learn. That's your role as management. Okay, we're going to look at energized people. <coughs> Normally I would have put this on the wall, but as I said, nothing sticks to this wall, so did that improv improvisation. That's what we call agile. Um, often I want hard, but I'm often too stubborn to say yes. I don't know what it is with me. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use you. Saying that you were my PA, that's Shane Hayes, he was my PA. Okay, um, motivation. As I said, uh, one of the views is energizing people. And one of the things you want to do is you want to motivate your people. So important. We got intrinsic motivation and we got extrinsic motivation. Um, I wrote a book. You can download it from my website, uh, go to LinkedIn and you'll find it. I wrote a book about Manage 3.0, my experiences. Why? Because I love to write. I love to share my experience via blog posts, via books, uh, whatever, because it gives me a very good feeling. So that's intrinsic motivation. It's really there. It's passion. <coughs> but there's also an extrinsic motivation for the fact that I wrote a book. It's about marketing. I need to promote myself. I need to build my brand. Let's be honest about it. So that's for me the extrinsic motivation. And both are important. If you look at management 1.0 organizations, factories, intrinsic motivation often works quite well. And there's nothing wrong with that. But because in that environment, it works quite well, as I said. The things that you do, probably extrinsic motivation is very important. You want to be challenged. You want to get, learn new stuff, etc. Who of you works for free? Yeah, you. <laughs> I mean, everybody has an intrinsic motivation. You all get a salary because it's important. And you want to have a salary, that's good. I mean, it doesn't have to be the highest in the market, it's my opinion, as long as you can trigger your extrinsic motivations. You can't, as management, I can't motivate you. I cannot make you laugh. I can tell a joke. I can do something funny. And that will make you laugh. And it's the same with motivation. 
I cannot make, motivate you. I cannot say, and now you're motivated. But I can do stuff that you really like, and you think, hey, that's cool. I want to learn about the new framework. I want to be in that project. But it gets you motivated. Uh, Stephen Rice, <coughs> 16 basic designs. He did research, and he found out that people all over the world are triggered, motivated by 16 basic designs. And that's, for example, family, food, uh, romance, uh, things like that. Some of them really private. Some of them could also be at work. Maslow, pyramid, first need to be safe before you can develop yourself. And then pink, uh, autonomy, drive. Now, uh, autonomy, purpose, and mastery. Thank you. That combined results in a new model, Champ Frogs. Thank you. So, Champ Frogs. It's about curiosity. How much are you motivated by curiosity? Do you want to discover new things? Do you want to be surprised? Or do you think, nah, not for me, please. I'm a bit autistic, I just want to do the same things. Nothing wrong with that. Some people are really motivated by curiosity. Honor. How important is you to have honor from your work? To get honor in your work? Um, some people really care about it. Some people, oh, it's okay for me. Acceptance. There are people who say, at work, I'm Ralph the work edition, and at home, I'm Ralph the private person. I don't believe in that, personally. I think you're always the same. Um, for some people, they say acceptance, so being the same, being myself at work, and being accepted for whom I am, who I am, is very important. I want to be myself. No dress code except being dressed. Some people, they say, I don't care. Mastery. Do you want to be challenged? Get out of your comfort zone? Just a bit to get, make a next step? Some people, no, they're okay with legacy projects. They care about other stuff. Power. And read slash influence. But if this would be influence, then this would not make this nice word. Influence. Power. Do you want to make a difference at work? Do you want to be involved in decision making? And there's nothing wrong with that. In that sense, for power. A friend of mine worked at a Dutch company. They were taken over by a US company. And guess what? A lot of decisions were made by management in the US. He was very unhappy about it because he really wants to make a difference. He wants to really help his team. And he couldn't do that anymore. For him, this was a big motivation. He left. <coughs> Freedom. Do you want to decide where you work, how you work, what kind of work you do? Previous session, they gave the example of Valve. People can uh, select their own projects. That's total freedom. Some people say, I don't mind. Because I really care about relatedness. I want to go out with my colleagues. And my statement is always, I'm not at work to make friends. If it happens, that's okay. But some people say, hey, I want to work with friends. I want to go out on Friday afternoon with my friends to have a drink. I want to go out to the cinema, do stuff together. I really care about it. Order. <coughs> and don't say, we're doing Agile, so we don't do order. Agile is very ordered and very structured, in my opinion. Order is about how many rules do you need? Is it just enough policies? Do you care about it? Or you don't need any rules? Chaos is for you. Goal. The things you care about in life. Could they be reflected in work? Can you work for a weapon factory? Can you work for a factory that produces cigarettes? I worked once with a company in the Netherlands, and they make software for primary schools on tablets to help children to learn. And all the people working there, they were really connected to that purpose of the company, because it was also in their personal goal in life. And status. How important is for you to have status? And I will be honest, being here on stage, I appreciate it, a bit nervous, but I like it, a bit of status. Nothing wrong with that. It's me motivated to come to India. So these are 10 motivators. <coughs> so what we're going to do, and now I could use some assistance in a few seconds. All right, yeah. Good. 
if you could give every table, every person in the room, a thing like this? Yes. Okay, don't focus too much on them and on the cards. Please stay with me. Yeah, one per person. You're gonna get a get get a hoop. You're gonna get a set of cards, and you can guess which words are on those cards. Jamfrox model. So what I would like you to do, pair up with somebody else, your neighbor, and then the, the space is a bit limited, but let's we can make it work. Order them from left to right. What's important for you? So in this case, for this person, mastery, curiosity, order, etc. Are important. The mastery of this person is most important. If you've done that, you order them, explain to your partner, your neighbor, why mastery is so important for you. Why does it be, what can you give examples? So explain the top three, because my experience often is the top three is often very clear. The last one, explain also please, because that's also very clear. The middle, it really depends on the weather, if you had a fight with your spouse or whatever. It can change every day. Top three, pretty stable, and the last one, pretty stable. So, to summarize, <coughs> you got those 10 motivators. What I would like you to do is order from left to right. What is the most important one for you? Explain that to your neighbor. Give some examples of the top three. Talk about it. If you've done that, then the other one also will talk about it with you. Maybe also explain the last one. Why is freedom not important for you? We're gonna do this for 50 minutes. It's a big group, so 50 minutes, and then we're going to do a small debrief. Okay, what did you observe? What did you experience? What questions do you have? And then we'll also explain how you can use this in your company to manage your organization and not the people. Clear? If you've got any questions, ask. Power for me is the need, the motivation to influence stuff, influence things. Uh, status is really okay. How important is it for you to be recognized as a thought leader, as the expert in whatever you do in your field of work? That's really status. That is really from the outside, how people see you. Power is really inside. Do you want to make a difference? Do you want to be involved? But that's the difference. On the cards, also short descriptions. So let's do this for 50 minutes. I start the timer now. Check. And. If you got questions, ask. <laughs> yes, with somebody else. Then you can talk about it. What is? Yeah. So in the fifth minutes, both people have to share their order and explain a bit. Talk about it. You can also do it with three people in triple. Oh, that was just an example. Yeah, so what you should do now for yourself is arrange them in priority. Okay. All right, let this give me more private talk. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So which what did you observe? Questions, remarks, what did you experience? And don't ask rhetoric questions, just to clear. Yeah? Yeah, true. Often people say, oh, I never thought about this. This is hard. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So what about that big corporate engagement program, one size fits all? How does that fit in here? Doesn't work. Yes, in the back, over there. Yeah, so these are mainly intrinsic motivators. Uh, I said they're based on different research. Uh, Stephen Rice also talked about romance slash sex. We left them out for this, because normally at work it should not be there. <laughs> this is mainly intrinsic business motivators. Any other questions? Of, yes. Yes, definitely. My experience is, as I said, the, the top three, top four, in this case top six with her, it's pretty stable, you know that. But over time, and then I'm talking about weeks, but I'm talking about years, uh, if you change as a person because of family, because of work, because you become more rich in experiences, yes, it can change. It will, it will change. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it could be. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing, um, somebody asked me, people ask me regular, regularly, often, can I use this to build teams? Can I use this if I pick three people who are really motivated by mastery, one by curiosity, one motivated by order, will I have a great team? I don't know. I don't believe you can use it in that uh, way. It's not like the role of Dalbin to build a team. It doesn't say anything about your behavior. That's very important to realize because it's what motivates you. And if you're really motivate, motivated by freedom, you can work in an environment where there's no freedom and you can do great stuff. But over time, I got the feeling you won't be happy. Satisfaction, engagement, happiness, it will get low because what motivates most of you is not there. But you can work in an environment where there's no freedom, even if freedom is important to you. So the fact that you have the same motivators could mean that there are some things in your company that you both like and you're both motivated by. My experience is also that if you do this with teams, especially technical teams, software development teams, mastery, curiosity, sky high. Status, order, low. Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> Yeah. 
Um, I disagree. And that's okay. We can agree to disagree. Uh, I think money is important, definitely. I mean, I don't do this. I don't. Know, I don't do my work for free. Let's be honest. As a manager, my statement is also: money should be fair. As a company, you pay a fair salary, and it doesn't have to be the highest, but definitely not the lowest in the market. If you pay a fair salary, and that depends on many things. I mean, I cannot answer the question what's fair for you, but if you pay a fair salary, and you have other things in your company that are really important for people. I think it's okay. It's better than having a high salary and having a boring job that does not motivate you. But that's how I look at it. Yes? Uh, I'm processing your question. Uh, how does it inspire? I think it's two different things, inspiration. I mean, I can inspire you, and I've been to meetings also with CEOs at the beginning of the year that they really inspired me. And then two weeks later, I thought, what the hell am I doing with this company? I really don't like my work. So I don't think it's really a connection. I mean, it can inspire people with great talks, uh, great things. Uh, but in the end, if the motivation is not there, if you're not connected to the organization, and you cannot find the things that you care about in your motivators, then inspiration won't help. Not sure if that answers your question. But okay, one more question, then I will. Oh. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. It goes hand in hand. But uh, only one thing inspiration and not motivated, it doesn't work. So, how can you use this? Um, I often use this when I got new teams for coaching, because I want to know the people. And the ones of you who were sitting next to a stranger, and you talked about 10 minutes, 15 minutes about what motivates you, I think you had a very relative deep conversation in a very short time about what really drives you in life, what drives you to work. So I think that's the power. So if you do this with your teams, you can get to know each other very quickly. Uh, I use it during recruitment interviews now and then. Not to judge people, definitely not. I mean, don't do that, please. But to get the people, get to know the people, to get the conversation going. Sometimes people tell me, yeah, well, but it says honor, but I've read the description, that's for me not in sync. I don't care. What I want to do is I want to get the conversation going. I want to talk about it. And you explain to me what honor is for you. And if that's something totally different than on the card, I don't mind. But I do know, well, I do want to know you. You can do this in a team. <coughs> Sometimes people say, yeah, but I can't do this in the team because they don't, whatever. Then you got another problem. But you can do it with a team. Just be open and transparent and understand each other's behavior. If you got a software developer in your team who is always keeping the code to himself, not sharing anything, maybe because that is very important for him. And if you make him community chairman of the community of practice or whatever, he can get status over there. And then you can maybe convince him or talk to him and say, hey, in the team, you can let go of your things you keep to yourself. Share it. That's how you can use it. Um, yeah. What you also can do. <coughs> oh, the other way. You can make a flip chart like this, or you can be much more creative than me. Sit together with your management team or with people from the organization who care about power because they want to influence stuff. And think about activities that you can connect to the different motivators. Mastery, curiosity, if I do this in the works, people often come up with hackathons. Relatedness, always easy for people. Drinking beer, going out, whatever. Uh, lunch together, sharing lunch, cooking together. Um, acceptance, some kind of dress code or no dress code except being dressed. I mean, you can come up with activities for all of those. And if you implement those in your organization, people can connect to the ones that they care about. Relatedness, as I said, uh, going out with colleagues. I probably won't join. 
that's okay. Hackathon, probably I will join. So if you have activity for all of those Jamfrogs letters, you got an engagement program that people can chip in where they want to. And then you manage the system and you don't manage the people. Um, I'm Dutch and we are a bit, how do you call it, uh, cheap. So what I did, I printed those for you. You can keep them, they're yours. But if you want to buy the official ones, they look the same, but they're a nice car box. You can go to manfree.o.com to the web shop and you can order them. You can also download them from the website, print them yourself, but they're available. So you can download and use them. <coughs> and as I said, you can keep those. Okay, so far, the energizing people part. Next one is energizing, oh, sorry, empowering teams. <coughs> yes, I could use some help. See, I can learn. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> this is a. A horse, thank you. I got a lot of things. People call it a unicorn, they call it a donkey. It's a horse. And the horse is happy. Um, the word management is derived from the Italian word managere. And managere means to handle horses. And I believe that of an agile organization, a modern organization, a team is the smallest entity. I mean, you can write a book alone. You can write a poem alone, you can make a song alone. But the things that you try to solve in your daily work, you need a team, period. So, teams. <coughs> Manager, handling horses, handling teams. Sometimes you have a team, it goes like the wind. You tell them what to do and off they go. And you don't see them back until they're done. It makes you feel happy. Sometimes a team, you tell them what to do, and you think they're going over there, they run that direction. And you lost them. Happens with horses, happens with teams. Sometimes they say, uh huh, and they just stay there. And you can't get them moving, whatever you do. And punishment is not an option. Sometimes you have teams, they're not moving, they don't do anything. They're just sitting there, basically, handling horses. If you talk about delegation, empowerment, often managers say, I cannot trust my team, so I need to check on them. Yes, of course, because that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't trust your team, you cannot trust your team. If you micromanage your team, you need to micromanage your team. Because your team will say, hey, you're checking on us, so why would I care? So that's why you want to delegate. Traditional organizations. Uh, we got the work in the middle, that's star, and then we got the manager. And in traditional organizations, and it's not about bashing, uh, managers often divide the work. This team's gonna do that one, you're gonna do work on that project, etc. <coughs> they tell how to do, what to do, etc. Management 1.0, command and control, hierarchy. But this is not a resilient organization. And already yesterday, Holacracy, uh, a lot of sessions of this conference are also about complexity, empowering teams, because this will fill. <coughs> you hired great people, so let give them the opportunity to do the great stuff. So you want to create something like this. Teams on the front line, great book about it from Frederick Laloux, Reinventing Organizations, where he describes this. Teams on the front line, doing the actual work, management in the back, servant leadership, facilitating, whatever you want to call it. But you're supporting the teams. This is called distributed control, because you control the distributed control over the teams. And management terms is called empowerment. Empowerment of teams. Often, uh, including myself, we make things black and white. Makes life easy. So, you got the dictator. Manager 1.0 manager. I tell you what to do, period. No discussion. And on the other end, you got the anarchist. The people in France with the yellow jerseys. We don't need management. Screw management. We can do everything alone. We don't need them. I don't know. Often the world is not that black and white. Mm. 
Um, one more thing, and I didn't write it on the flip chart because it depends on the language where you are. In English, you got accountability and responsibility. In many languages, including Dutch, the difference is not there in words. It depends on the context. But it's a very important difference. Accountability, you as management, you as a manager, you're accountable. When the shit has to fan, they're coming to you. Simple as that. But you want to make the team responsible. You want to give them responsibility to do a great job. So that's the difference, the very important difference. <coughs> Empowerment. If you look up the definitions, you will find two words. Uh, the ability and the accountability. Accountability is okay. I give you, I empower you on our financial software, on our financial system. I give you the accountability. That's a bit like the dictator, that part. The other definition is about the ability. I empower you to do our social media campaign. I give you the ability. Ability is related to grow, helping, growing somebody. Accountability is like setting borders. Ability is a bit like to the anarchist style of thinking. Belongs more on that side. Accountability on this side. <coughs> I'm still a manager now and then, or working with team members. And, you know, if I do things myself, I know one thing for sure, they're done correctly. At least that's what I think. Because I need to explain, it will cost so much time. That's also a pitfall that many managers make with, when they talk about delegation. If I need to explain to my team, it takes so much time, and then I still don't know what they will deliver, and I will do it myself, because delegation is costing so much time. I mean, if you keep doing that, the organization will never be ready for the future. If you talk about delegation or management leadership, you often talk about superiors and subordinates. It's something like hierarchy. I'm on the stage, you're down there, I give you the work, you can do the work. You also have different management models about delegation, where the assumption always is that you delegate things to the team. I know teams who say, manager, we don't want to do this. You take care of it. But when you talk about superiors and subordinates, it's, it's not really there in the wording. <coughs> so why not call it control takers and control givers? And the manager can be the control taker, but also be the control giver. And the team can also be the other one. The team can give control to the manager. Why is it wrong as a team to now and then say, hey manager, can you please take care of this? We find it too complicated, we're not ready for it. If you talk about delegation, you talk about trust. I already saw it in a few sessions. Trust. <coughs> you as a manager, you need to trust your team. And you trust your team based on the people that you, how good you know them, how well you know them, based on the track record, based on because you may have given full trust from the start. But you need to trust them. If you don't trust them, you won't give them any empowerment. You don't empower them. The team needs to trust you. So you need to be a bit knowledge about the area that you're working in. You need to be consistent in your behavior. And you need to be able to build relationships. Then the team will trust you. The team members need to trust each other. If you don't trust your team member, you're not going to work together as a team. You're not a team, so no delegation or empowerment. And the last one that we often don't realize, you as a manager, you need to trust yourself. Are you feel confident that you can empower your team? Or do you think, I don't know, in the moment that they make a mistake, you take it back? Do you trust yourself that you can do it? Very important. <coughs> Again, the horse. And this time the horse looks sad. And the horse is in pain. Because what happened, the horse was out there in the meadow, running around, and suddenly it hit something. And it was very painful. And it was some barbed wire that he couldn't see. Because it was dark and the barbed wire was not visible and it hurts. So what will the horse do? It won't go in that area of the meadow anymore. It will stay away from there. Because in that area something hurts. And that's exactly the same with teams. If you as a team take certain responsibility, certain decisions in a certain area, and manager is not happy about it, they will punish you. 
somehow. We will get feedback, depending on the team, depending on the manager. You as team, you think, that hurts. We're not going there anymore. And if that happens too much, you as a team, you stay here. You'll just do the things you need to do. And that's it. So, how can we solve this problem? <coughs> By making it not black and white, by making it gray, seven, gray, seven levels of delegation. Seven levels of delegation. The first one is tell. You, as a manager, you tell the team what to do. Period. You make the decision. If necessary, you're going to inform the team, but even not necessary to do it. You make the decision. The second level is sell. <coughs> the manager tries to convince you why this is the best decision for you, as a team, as a person. So this often, this often happens with your new salary. Your manager is telling you, okay, uh, you get a 3% raise, 10% raise, because this and this and this. And then you say, I disagree. And the manager says, bad luck. Because I'm selling you this, and you can buy it or not, but this is what's going to happen. The third is consult. The manager, the lead, asks the opinion of the team. And he really cares about your opinion. So if the whole team says we have to go to the left, and the manager says we're going to the right, that would be weird. Or you should have very good arguments. The consult is asking the team for opinion. So one, two, three, the manager decides. Period. Simple. <coughs> the fourth is agree. Manager and team agree together. And it's not a democracy. I mean, democracy is an organization that's totally overrated, in my opinion. It's agree. It's a consent. Does anybody have any serious objections about this proposal? And because you just don't like it, that's not an objection. That's not an objection, it's just an opinion. Um, so you agree together. Manager and team. Manager has no veto, they're the same as the team. <coughs> Five, six, seven, team decides. Fifth, it's the opposite of three, is advice. You as a manager, you advise the team. Hey guys, uh, I know you're gonna work in this project. I did it also with my previous job and this could be a way to handle this project. Make sure that you do it like that, but it's up to you, you decide. So he advises the team, the team decides in the end what to do, how to do it. Six, inquire. You as a team, you tell the manager what you decided. It's a bit like the opposite of sell. Hey manager, we decided, to do, 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 we decided to do this, this, and this, and we decided to implement Trello for you. And then the manager says, okay. Seven, delegate. You figure it out yourself. I don't want to know about it. Go have fun. I don't know, it could be the desks in the office, the team set up in the office, you figure it out yourself. So five, six, seven, team decides, one, two, three, manager decides, four, you do it together. What we're going to do in a few, uh, with the white flip charts, we're going to create a delegation board. Because that's how you can use the organization. The first thing you need to do is think about key decision areas. And you write them down in this column, in the first column. <coughs> and key decision areas are the borders. That are the constraints. So that could be, for example, leave. Who decides on leave? Who decides on tooling? Etc. The key decision areas, the first thing. For this exercise in the few, if you have five, it's more than enough. If you've done that, you're gonna play the delegation poker. You're gonna play where to put the marks. Leave, in this case, two. So the manager tells the team when they can take leave, okay. Uh, second one, tooling, four. We agree together on what is the best tooling for a project. Who is not familiar with planning poker? Okay, cool. I don't explain that. Um, um, uh, let me show you one more example. <coughs> so this is how it could look. And um, can you turn around that picture, please? Yeah. No, no, that, that's one. We're going to do simulation. 
and to have a generic case. See, that's the thing with delegation. You often think, I could have done that myself better. And I probably couldn't. Thank you. We're going to do a circle box. That's Starbucks. So the first thing I want to do, add your table, and let's split the table in two groups. Otherwise, it gets too big. So two groups per table. You need to select an owner. The owner of this coffee shop. The guy or woman who invested money in this coffee shop. And it's the first day. He did a management 2.0 workshop, and he thinks, hey, this delegation board, I love it. I'm going to use it. So the first day of his coffee shop, he hired baristas, people to work in his coffee shop, and we're going to do this together. So the first thing is, okay, decide on the key decision areas. So in this case, it's leaf, and the second one is uh, blue indaling. That's a uh, floor setup. Could be menu, coffee beans, uh, etc. Prices, all the things you need to do for a coffee shop. Five key decision areas. Then the next thing is, okay, let's play a delegation game. You all get a set of cards for my uh, assistants in a few. You pick the definition of the delegation of you think it should be. You play the card together. And if you all play the four, easy. Then it's four. If somebody plays one, the other plays seven. That's interesting. Yes? Can I have some assistance? <coughs> Uh, these are cars of seven, and you can give uh, everybody one set of seven. Yes, every person in the room. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just give everybody one to seven. Okay, so you got those big flip charts on the table. I think two per table. Uh, take one per group. So every group has three, four people. First, select the owner, or just appoint the owner, because it's important. You will experience some things. Then create a matrix. Decide on the key decision areas, and then play the game. Yeah, make the group uh, make the group four to five people. So depending on how many people on your table, you can maybe uh, have one group or maybe split up. Yeah. Everybody had a set of cards. You got cards? Okay. Oh, you don't have cards yet. Okay. Um. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I have. Maybe one more set here. Yeah, yeah, okay, covered. <coughs> Everybody has set? Okay. <coughs> so, first step is make the matrix, easy. Select the manager, the uh, owner. Um, Define the key decision areas. If you got five, it's more than enough. Yeah, okay, thank you. Think about menu, schedule, floor setting, prices. Those are the definition areas, right? That are the key definition areas, yes. And that's setting up a coffee shop. Yes, the context is you're going to set up a coffee shop. And how many areas minimum? If you got five, it's more than enough in this case. Yes. I just want you to experience the game. There's one manager and the other ones are all just waiters, co-workers, whatever. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. So let's let's have 
I can talk about this for hours and do this workshop for hours, but we got lunch in eight minutes. Uh, but we'll be a bit over time. But if you want to leave, feel free to leave, of course. Um, let's do a. Um, I'm going to do a debriefing from my side on, because otherwise it will take too much time. Now, if you've got questions afterwards, you can still ask them in the group. Um, this is a very powerful tool. It's very easy to understand, but very powerful. The reason, and uh, maybe some of you encountered it, that I asked somebody to be the manager or the owner, is sometimes you will not be able to make a decision, because you got four, five, six different cards on the table. Who will make the decision in the end? The team? The manager? The manager, of course. Because he, she invested money in this coffee shop. <laughs> he or she is accountable. It's the same with the organization, many organizations still. Uh, there's some kind of hierarchy. Somebody who's a project manager, project lead, product owner. He will make the decision in the end, lead architect. So the guy who gives control overall will make the decision. It can't be that the team itself is going to move markers over the board because they think it's better. Not done. I mean, democracy is overrated, definitely in companies. Um, what happens if the team plays six or seven and you as manager play one or two? If you got different cards on the table, talk about it. I mean, my opinion is a lot of games, tools, and management 2.0 are there to get the conversation going. Talk about it. Exchange ideas, visions. If you still think as a team that you should be able to boot, do it on level six or seven, then the manager, yeah, the manager can say, okay, let's move to level three, consult. I'm going to ask your opinion. I'm going to make the decision in the end, but I want to hear your opinion. And if I, in every decision that we have to make together, I hear the same way of thinking that's as I think it should be, then maybe I can move to a four, because you can gain trust. That's how you can use it. Sometimes it happens that the manager plays higher than the team. Interesting. So the team is saying, we don't feel really comfortable about making our own leave schedule. Can you do that, please, manager? But the team is giving control back to the manager. So it's okay. The goal is to make everything seven. And there's another thing that managers often think. If everything is seven, everything is delegated to the team. Oh, my God, what would I do? 
if you as a team manager, as a lead, put everything on seven and the team is happy about it, you're the greatest manager in your company. And you get flowers and applause. And you will get a new team. Because you did a great job. And if the company does not value that, get out. Uh, but, in reality, I don't think you will manage to get to seven. Because there are always constraints, always things that the team doesn't feel comfortable about. Constraints from the organization that make you mandatory to make the decision. You can use this in every situation when there's somebody making a decision and a team. It can be between the architect and the software development teams. It can be between the product owner and the development team. Because often there's also some kind of a hierarchy. Uh, so all those situations, you can make use this. Also between the manager and his team leads. Also between the CEO and the board. And for some reason they think they're too good for this, or that's too childish, but they can use this. You need to review this regularly. It's not set in stone. So if you do this, put it on the wall, make a picture, so you're also safe for audits, because hey, this is how we do it. If you write it down a word, or you make it like this, it's the same. You're safe for audits, and you review it regularly, every three months, depending on the context. <coughs> Sometimes, um, for example, with leave, leave schedule of leave, uh, if the whole team is on leave, then, I don't know, so I want to make a decision as a team manager. But why not add one or two constraints? Guy, guys, leave, you as team decide. One constraint, at least two developers need to be in. But for the rest, it's up to you. If you have a key decision areas, and you got 55 constraints, it's level one, period. Then you just... Um, if you as a manager, let's talk from that perspective, Put something on level five, six, seven. So the team decides. And they make a decision. And you think, oh my God. How? The one thing you can't do is overrule that decision. You have to accept that decision. Unless the company goes bankrupt. Otherwise, you have to accept that decision. The moment you're going to step in and going to tell the team, guys, I'm going to overrule you. You're screwed. You're gone. Talk about trust. We won't have any trust, not for the next months, for the next years, because it will stay in the collective memory of the team, and even if team members will leave, they will always think about you as a manager, we know, that delegation board, that thing, yeah, yeah, nice game, but <laughs> so don't do it. What you should do is, okay, guys, let's review the delegation board. Uh, you made the decision, I respect your decision, but I'm going to move it back to level three. I want to be in a meeting where the decision will be made next time in this area. One more other thing uh, from my side. Um, define the key decision areas. I mean, two things. So you as a manager, you play this in level three. You ask advice of the team, to consult of the team. Then you decide where to put them on. But the second thing is, uh, the discussion about the key decision areas can already be very valuable. Because maybe you also encounter it. Okay, you have menu, but what do we mean, what do we mean menu? Is that also coffee? Do we serve food? So talking about those key decision hours can be very valuable. When you have the matrix ready, give it to the manager and give it to the team. Both fill it in and then compare it. And then suddenly you understand why the team doesn't make a decision. Or the team understands why you always make the decision. Because the team thought they were on level 6 and you thought they were on level 2. That's interesting. But it will also give you some transparency and some clearness. Okay, but how do we look at things from different uh, sites. Um, very powerful tool, easy to use and fun to use. Any questions so far? In my experience, how many of the time we have seen that uh, there are multiple levels in an enterprise? Uh, the <coughs> senior most leaders, uh, uh, yeah. this thought process, how does it influence that state by team? Or have you seen different patterns at each of the levels of the I've seen it so far only, unfortunately, in one company where I work with that had two levels. It was between director and, let's say, project managers, and within project managers and within the team, those two levels. And they had different levels. I mean, the project, the director talked to the project manager, it's a weird case, about starting projects, uh, budget of the project, etc. while the project managers talk with their team members about who makes the decision about the projects. And there are two different things, because often it's not just different decisions that you make. And it's also, I think, as a director, you don't care about how the team does its work, I hope. So you leave that up to the team. 
and the project manager with the team, they can say something about uh, process, who decides Scrum, Kanban, Lean, whatever. But on the level of the director, I would say, I don't care. As long as you get the job done, I'm happy. But that really depends on organization and how the culture is in that organization. Okay, another question? Another question? Remark? Okay, um, I got movement motivators over, and I'm not going to take them home. So you can take them home if you want to. Uh, they're here in the box, so take them if you want to. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we put the flip charts on the walls, so if you want to make pictures, feel free to do. I will try to share them also in the slide deck with the organizers, so you can also download them from the website. Uh, if you have any questions or you want, just want to link on LinkedIn with me, feel free to do. Uh, I'm always available. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, enjoy your day.